Knowledge is power. And this is powerful stuff. Wellness Education Cannabis Advocates of Nevada present the Weekend 702 Nevada Cannabis News Hour with your host, Jen Solis. For the next 60 minutes, we'll take an in-depth look at the cannabis reform revolution sweeping the nation. The phone lines are open at 731-1230. That's 731-1230 or toll-free. Toll-free. 1-866-820-5528. That's 1-866-820-KLAV. Now, let's bring on the host. Here is Jen Solis. Hi, welcome everybody to our show. This is Nevada Cannabis News. Uh, Weekend 702's radio show for cannabis news in Nevada, regionally, and beyond. So... To my right is Raymond Fletcher and Beach, William Beach Baker. Kurt is on hiatus today, hacking his brains up. Um, so on with the local news. Raymond, what do you got for us? Well, we certainly first off hope that Kurt gets better and joins us again when he's not sickly passing off the germs. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Uh, what I have is Las Vegas medical marijuana deadline draws a crowd. There was fierce competition. And the medical marijuana apps are posted online. The, the marijuana apps are posted online. They had how many applicants? I think it was like 68, 70, something like that. Is it somewhere around there? Uh, 63 groups. 63 groups vied for like what? Five? Five the, dispensaries? 12 dispensaries in the city of Las Vegas. Yeah, there there were uh, originally 63, but two of the groups withdrew, so it left uh, the final cut at 61. At 61. There were people sitting on the ground, people putting stuff into their books at the last minute, people going crazy. Uh, they even set up a special room just to uh, turn in your application. You would pay downstairs and then they went upstairs to like the fourth floor and they had tables set up and and all sorts of stuff just for the medical marijuana applicants. Um, you had to draw or pull a number before 3 p.m. and with, um, then you were guaranteed to be able to turn in your application. Uh, with that is that they, they will send you a list of list of stuff that you need to fix or that is missing from your application for the city within about a week. And some were just outright rejected. Well, that, well, that's that's certainly interesting. Um, I know the city, they set up a map on its medical marijuana website. Mm -hmm. and you can go to the city of Las Vegas uh, website and access that. And you can, all, you can click on a site and see the names of some of the applicants, although the limited, li limited liability names are not listed. Yeah, LLCs are not listed. They're listed uh, under uh, the corporation's name. Um, some of the applicants uh, that I know that that applied. Um, well, there were there, there were a lot of local heavyweights. Yeah. You know, you have mayors. The mayor's son, Ross Goodman. Now this is going to wow. be interesting. Now that's what I think. It. The the mayor has steadfastly opposed medical marijuana, even though she is on record as saying that she has a relative that uses it. Yep. And her son has an application before the city mm -hmm. and the former mayor her husband Oscar mm -hmm. supports the well I'm, I'm really familiar with this because we used to do coffee with the mayor with Oscar quite often and he's really friendly approachable very friendly about medical marijuana and that's where I found out about that they had a um, that they had a family member that uh, has medical marijuana and so when the changing of the guard happened between her and her husband uh, I go out to coffee with the mayor with her and I start bringing up medical marijuana and it's like she just bit into a lime or something and she got that face like ugh. you know I, I have the utmost respect for mayor Goodman you know my, my good one? friend oh, no. Carolyn, <laughs> Carolyn my, my good okay. friend but I don't know if she's trying to be so unlike Oscar that she just opposes it vehemently or if there are sincere reasons that she has 
And if the mayor or one of her staff members are listening, you know, or if you have that connection, please go ahead and call us, you know, sit down, let us know why is it that you are opposed to medical marijuana? Well, you know what I ask when I ask her point blank, why, why she uh, was, was so sourpussed about it, uh, for lack of a better term. She, she told me that the person that was in her family had it in a prescription and it was, the dose was exact. And I said, well, you know, that's not what your husband said. And then she just like gave me the look like, get out of here, kid. <laughs> You know, you know, it is such a shame, and, and if that is indeed the circumstance, that would be the first I've ever heard of that circumstance. Well, unless it's like Sativex or, or one of the pill forms of THC, but that's worse. That's worse than the actual plant itself. But I knew that uh, I knew that Ross was in the game because he attended our first symposium. I think our first or, and our second symposium, Ross Goodwin was there. I got introduced to him, and I was just so crazy. It was like somebody said, oh, this is Ross Goodman. And I'm like, oh, good to meet you, and shook his hand, not knowing, you know, who he was. Oopsie. <laughs> Oopsie. That's okay. I've, I've been there at numerous political events. You just get a brain fart. Just absolutely do not know who the individual is. But some of the other prominent names include Ed Bernstein, who also applied at the county level, philanthropist guard and Dr. Florence Jameson, mm -hmm. restaurant tours, Michael and Jenna Morton, mm -hmm. uh, two private investigators, Peter Mayhew and Steve Rybar. Oh, yeah, I know both of those guys. They're with Greenleaf Holdings, um, which is also Weed TV. Although, you know, that's Weed TV, basically. Right. I believe uh, the last was an undercover officer uh, who brought down uh, a Nevada state senator. <laughs> uh, well, and state senator Mark James was an applicant. But the city, like you were talking about the, the paperwork, the city required much more paperwork. You know, and some of the requirements, you know, was a bond of $250,000. Correct. You know, the, so they really didn't want the patients, the local people, the average folks. No, they didn't. Um, they wanted people with the financial will, wherewithal to um, to get into business and to sustain it for the first year and be able to not go bankrupt. But, you know, the fact of the matter is, is that, you know, th these type of businesses... They do. There is a lot of overhead to get started. But if you find investors, then, you know, that's that's one thing. And all the while, um, uh, our honorable mayor, um, Carolyn Goodman, she was saying, you know, what about the co-ops? So is uh, Bob Coffin. What about the co-ops? I'd like to see co-ops. And she was she was the big one on nonprofits, nonprofits. And I said, well, you know, if you approve me for one, um, you know, Ms. Goodman, then then you know we'll run it non-profit but you know putting that two hundred fifty thousand dollar bond on there putting the two hundred fifty thousand dollars liquid on there and all sorts of stuff makes it a little bit um makes it a little bit cost prohibitive for a non-profit or a co-op to exist because you have to have the funds and then you can only sell it to your co-op members well so thankfully we can it's for the little people you know and regardless of whom wants to give a contribution we are a grassroots organization we do advocate for the patient and we will continue to do so and you know we need to address some of these laws and you know that's that's where you know advocating for the patients comes in well you know we uh, we, uh, we can we've always advocated for the patients and and right now our thrust uh, our thrust was safe access and then we in getting the dispensaries and going up to Carson City um, you know we were told that then the patient would have to give up their ability to grow and I went oh, 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 let's put the brakes on right here because you know what this is not even fair this is not even right you're advocating for straight socialism this is that's socialism you know that when you take the ability of a person to do for themselves and you give it to the whole and then tell them that they have to purchase it through the whole or the dispensary that's a socialistic concept and when they told me when when they asked me about it up at up in Carson City and I said you know you're advocating advocating for socialism then they wouldn't let me talk because <laughs> you know that would have gone over like a turd in a punch bowl up there yes you and i have that in common we, uh, <laughs> we, we we say what's on our mind without you know really thinking of how it will play out 
I just wanted to No, know. I knew how that played out. Like a turn to punch bulb, and that's why they wouldn't let me talk because I would make them basically all look at their look at their actions and see what for what it what it really is for. It's for what they were advocating for is big business. They were advocating against the little person and they were advocating not for the patient. It's safe access for patients who are not yet patients. But people that are already patients and already growing are suddenly getting elbowed aside. That's not my style and that's not my gig. We're in, and so that's WeCan's next thrust is to make sure that patients retain their ability to grow. And, and, Tick, and Tick promised that we would address this and, and you know I'll make sure to hold them to that, really. And, and that's the important thing about advocating, to make sure that those people that give you a commitment they fall through with their commitment, and I, and I, you know, am happy to join you with continue to advocating that we as patients have the opportunity. Look, we have the ability to grow twelve plants. Yep. You know, up to twelve plants. Some people may not be full, growing their full twelve, but we have that ability. We should be able to keep that ability, regardless of if there's a dispensary or not. Within twenty five miles, for heaven's sake. Okay, so, uh, so on to more local news. We got a town hall meeting in Mesquite uh, tonight. Tonight, so our friends in the Mesquite area, from five to seven at ten Mesquite at ten East Mesquite Boulevard. The meeting is to discuss the medical marijuana industry, its impact on the city, economy, jobs, and resources. Wow, that's awesome! So that's it's probably going to come up fairly quick and uh, quickly in their agenda. Their agendas aren't usually too long. And for those of you um, that don't know where Mesquite is, Mesquite is one of the first cities that you enter after you leave uh, Utah. Uh, the about the only thing that they got going for them uh, is the tourist industry, but I think they also have um, some agriculture. You know what I've seen on the side uh, side of the roads and stuff like that. Um, and and so if you are in the Mesquite area, please go up to number 10, East Mesquite Boulevard, Mesquite, Nevada. I was going to say, are there any other streets in Mesquite? <laughs> Very few. I do not know. <laughs> All right. More from local news. Henderson. Henderson gets 28. I love how they do this on uh, news articles. 28 medical marijuana applications and they are poised to cash in the city received whoa the city received uh, uh 28 applications uh each with a ten thousand dollar non-refundable fee Woo, that's stiff yeah the city is expected to receive state approval for five dispensaries but it's not limited on the amount of cultivation facilities and that seems like it's a theme going on throughout all communities is the state has said that they are not going to limit cultivation facilities for the first year. Am I correct? You are correct. If you grow it, they will come. Well, what's interesting is, you know, it says the city is expected to receive state approval for five dispensaries. But don't forget, it was the Clark County that readjusted their numbers. Yeah. So it'll be interesting to see if Clark County only gets the 10 that they were allotted, if Las Vegas gets the only the 10 that they were allotted rather than 12, and then Henderson and North Las Vegas see their numbers increase. You know, that that is an interesting question. And um, August 5th through the 18th is the deadline for the state applications for all of the municipalities. So the state deadline is from the 5th into the 18th. You have to have your state application in. North Las Vegas is doing it just a little bit differently. You have to submit your uh, state application first and then you submit your North Las Vegas application to North Las Vegas. The only thing that you're going to need to do is to, you're going to need to make sure that the zoning is correct for any North Las Vegas facility that you want um, to, uh, to open. Um, and you can do that through um, zoning. You mean they're not going to do the process first and then send it on to the state no they're going to let everybody uh, submit their applications to the state and then they're going to vet them down here jumping g willikers is that not the way it was supposed to go through exact <laughs> wow so i just want to say thank you to the north las vegas city leaders for doing it the way that they were supposed to do it 
Yeah, for being fair in our process. Um, back to local news, our gaming board is sticking to the medical uh, medical pot stance. Um, there are a lot of there are a lot of businesses that have one member removed from their family. Well, like the husband is in a slot position, you know, in some kind of gaming industry, and then the wife wants to go for some medical marijuana industry um, applications and zoning. Um, yeah, that's a story we've been following, you know. And I, I know the gaming board recently uh, met. And they 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 stood steadfast in their position. Yeah, and the fallout from the control board's ruling is just beginning. Uh, the wife of Bruce Familian, owner of a slot machine route operator in uh, Nevada Gaming Partners, is expected to sell her 8% stake in GB Sciences Nevada LLC. And the business, uh, the business was awarded to one of 18 medical marijuana dispensary licenses in June uh, by the Clark County Commission. So she has to sell her 8% stake yes. in GB Sciences. She sold her 8%. Troy Herbst. My good old friend. <laughs> Troy Herbst, whose fathers and brothers own Jet Gaming, is no longer part of the slot machine route operation, according to the company's attorney. Troy Herbst decided to concentrate on his 10% stake in, uh, in Clinic Nevada D1 LLC, which also received a Clark County dispensary license. Then we have Las Vegas uh, Sun owner and publisher Brian Greenspun. Didn't uh, he, he just said, sell his... Shares he, too? Yep. <laughs> he said Tuesday that he sold his uh, shares of Greenspun Gaming LLC and GC uh, Investments to family members. Uh, the businesses own portions of Barley's Casino, the Wildfire in Henderson, Green's Cafe, and the Palms. Brian Greenspun is also in, in uh, part of Integral Associates, which is also seeking a medical marijuana dispensary in Henderson. Well, I was going to say his sister, uh, Jamie Gale. Or Janie Greenspun Gale, as a matter of fact, um, was applying for a application in Clark County, and they did not get it. And they are applying for one in the city, and um, and that's inter that'll be interesting to see how that plays up because the Greenspun name isn't on her name because she's a Gale; she got right. married. Um, so it's going to be interesting if she uses Greenspun hyphen Gale, or she just drops a Greenspun all together. Yeah, for sure. For sure. And then you have another one? Uh, Barry Moore, who has a restricted gaming license for several taverns, including Shucks Gaming and Oyster Bar and Beano's Cas uh, Casino, may sell the businesses so that his wife can hold on to her ownership in GB Sciences. Their attorney, J.T. Moran III, did not return phone calls when we were seeking comment. Well, I think it's safe to say that the gaming regulator's message has been heard industry-wide. This controversy could go away if Congress removes the criminal stigma from medical marijuana. Uh, U.S. Representative Dina Titus is hoping to accomplish that task. She co-sponsored an amendment to a resolution last month that halts Justice Department interference when states implicate, implement medical marijuana laws. I think they're going back on their 10th Amendment, you know, states' rights type, uh, a type of issue. And I love Dina, you know. Well, she disagreed with the control board, but however, you know, I disagree with her because the game and control board, you know, they they have more experience in this than she does. Well, that's true. Well, um, we're going on a break now, and when we come back, we'll talk about more regional news. We'll talk about the House and the Senate and Colorado's shortage of medical marijuana. Cannabis has been used as a healing medicine for over 5,000 years with no toxic side effects. Is it right for you? The professionals at Dr. Reefer are here to help. Now accepting new patients, make an appointment today at 428-0000. Bring your medical records, or if you don't have them, their staff will work to document your qualifying condition with a 99% approval rate. If you have any of the following conditions, cancer, AIDS, muscle spasm diseases, severe nausea, severe pain, Crohn's disease, glaucoma, or PTSD, call Dr. Reefer today for your free consultation and their money-back guarantee. If you don't qualify, you don't pay. Call 702-428-0000 to get your Nevada medical marijuana card today. 
Weekend 702 is a Nevada cannabis community. We are a 501c3 nonprofit that meets in Southern Nevada. We are a social group that started in Las Vegas for patient support. We've been active in the community for over five years. If you'd like to join us on any of our events or parties, please contact us through Facebook at Weekend 702 on Meetup at www.meetup.com forward slash Weekend 702. Our website is www.weekend702.org. Be a part of the Nevada Cannabis Reform Revolution. Please join us and donate today. Locally owned and operated TSI Total Safety Incorporated has kept our community safe since 1998. We provide superior services offering professional installation, local fire and burglar alarm monitoring, and the fastest response times in Las Vegas. We also offer armed and unarmed security, video security systems, access control, and fire safety installation and service. All of your security needs are covered. Call us at 702-967-0000. That's 702-967-0000 or visit us at TSIVegas.com. Hi, welcome back. Our 420 moment uh, spotlight today is on Snoop Dogg. Snoop Dogg's birth name is Calvin Codozor Broadius Jr., also known as Snoop Doggy Dog, Snoop Lion, Snoop Dogg, DJ Snoopadelic, Snoopzilla, <laughs> was born on October 20th, 1971. He's, um, uh, he's age 42. He was born in Long Beach, California, and he is, uh, he has a boy, his parents nicknamed him Snoopy because of his appearance. Um, and he started his singing and rapping uh, career or singing career in church playing the piano and in sixth grade he began rapping who would have thunk that he was a nice little church boy oh i will tell you many many rappers are church boys and you know that you know they sin on saturday and they go to church on sunday mm -hmm. don't you be telling me that you're partying on saturday mm -hmm. and then going to church on sunday um but he is our 420 moment so Here's to you, Snoop Dogg. And you know what? I heard that he's living here now. Is he? Yeah, that he's living in Las Vegas and that his son is playing uh, football for um, Bishop Gorman. Oh, we'll have to figure that out. Uh, Jimmy Kimmel joined Snoop on his GGN YouTube show and asked him a very interesting question. If he'd ever smoked in the White House, Snoop responded. I smoked weed in the bathroom in the White House. Right on, Snoop. In the bathroom. Get not, it. <laughs> not in the White House, but in the bathroom. Well, it is in the White House bathroom. So there you go. Well, he's not alone. You know, Willie Nelson uh, famously smoked marijuana on the roof of the White House when Carter was president. I believe it. I believe it. So Snoop Dogg, our 420 moment. here, see. That's right. <laughs> Hit it. And okay, quit. you guys, uh, moving on to, like, regional news, regional news from Arizona. This is a little, this is a little story that touches, you know, a portion of my heart there. Arizona Superior Court judge has ruled that patients can legally sell their cannabis to other patients. You know, this was what originally got me on the safe access bandwagon. I was growing marijuana and... All my excess, I would have to give away and not sell. And, you know, I also have a state nursing license. And, you know, I didn't want to get caught up in anything. And I didn't want to get over my amount. And when I harvested one plant, I was over the amount, which was then one ounce. Oh, so, wow. Yeah, exactly. So it would be like I would harvest a plant and be like, oh, guess what, you guys? It's Christmas time. Here you go, some trees. And, and and I was just like, you know what? This is crazy. Why can't I sell my excess marijuana to other people? And if people can't grow in their house because it's some kind of a, a apartment or they have a landlord situation or they're just too sick, let's face it. Why can't I sell mine to them? And um, they certainly wouldn't be at dispensary prices, I imagine. No, no. My overhead is much lower. Um, no $100 a quarter? 
No. So a Pima uh, uh, County Superior Court judge has thrown out charges against a man who sold cannabis plants to an undercover cop posing as a patient, ruling that distribution of cannabis from one patient to the next isn't illegal based on the wording of the 2010 voter-approved initiative. The ruling, although expected to be challenged and brought to the state's uh, uh, Supreme Court, paves the way for patients to legally sell cannabis to other patients. Um, this, this, you know, I hope to bring this up here in Nevada because I, seriously, now I harvest a plant and I can only keep two and a half ounces and I'm a good grower. You know, some of that blue dream yields like maybe three, four, five ounces of usable bud. And then we have the, you know, the trim and the shake and stuff like that, that, you know, can make, be made butter. Um, it, it's just crazy that I can't sell, well, I, now I can sell to a dispensary as a patient in our Nevada law. That's one of the that's one of the, the loopholes. And it's going to be interesting to see where all these um, grow facilities get all their seeds and everything and get started. Well, you know, I got some when I was in Pahrump. Okay, I'm going to tell you something just between me and you. <laughs> well, and everybody else. Okay, I don't when, think anyone's listening. <laughs> Well, I hope they're listening. But when I was in Pahrump and one of the Stanley brothers came down and was talking about Charlotte's Web, um, he was talking about Charlotte's Web and that they were going to bring Charlotte's Web here to Nevada. And then he brought some products out on the table that were liquid and that were elixirs and that were different products that were packaged. And I was just like, I'm, I'm sitting there going, am I the only one that is listening to this man saying that he is going to break a federal trafficking law and bring Charlotte's Web from Colorado and traffic it into Nevada? Am I the only one that's hearing this? And no one objected. No one said anything. No one said anything. And, um, you know, I had a little sideline conversation with the district attorney afterwards. And I said, you know, doesn't it bother you that that they're breaking they're they're saying that they're going to break federal trafficking laws and he looked at me goes oh well they haven't done it yet and i said you know all that packaging he just brought up it's got marijuana in it and it came from colorado and that box says colorado on it so de facto he's broken federal trafficking laws sitting here and the state the district attorney and prompt just kind of looked and said <laughs> and i was like oh okay so you know Turn to punch bowl, Tom. Turn to punch bowl. Um, more from Arizona uh, news. That uh, the University of Arizona alumnus starts a petition to reinstate Sue Sicily. This was in the news last month. Um, that Ms. Sicily got removed from a post at Arizona State University, where she had a federal grant and a federal okay to. Um, to do a research on PTSD and cannabis and how they're linked and, you know, how the cannabis can help PTSD. And so she had a federal research grant and everything was going good. And then Arizona, uh, this Arizona State University just kind of stepped up and said, uh-uh, no, you're fired. Um, so now they're doing a petition to reinstate her. Yeah. Yeah, and she's one of the foremost experts in using medical marijuana to treat PTSD. Um, and, and she had a green light to do, to start this and to, and to go with it. And then, and then suddenly she just got fired from her job and it's made a, a lot of, um, headline news. I, I recently saw her, I think on CNN and, um, you know, of course Sanjay's all over it. Right. <laughs> well, we'll keep an eye out on the story and follow up as it goes along. For sure. Well, Oregon will be able to vote in November on whether they want to legalize marijuana for recreational use. I thought it was already freaking legal in Oregon. That's, I believe that's for medical use. Oh, well, I mean, you know. Yeah. Like everybody and their brother smoking in Oregon. And pretty much so. <laughs> you know, but, um, you know, it'll join, you know, was it the three other, two other states? It's uh, Colorado Washington. and Washington. So and it could perhaps be the third state that allows uh, recreational marijuana. Well, go Oregon. Go Ducks, right? Uh, well, on to Colorado. Colorado's voters are cool with members-only clubs. 
Well, I've been in Colorado recently, and um, I was staying near Colorado Springs, a little town called Manitou Springs. I had to go 50 miles to a recreational shop to get meds, even though I'm a patient in Nevada. But to get recreational meds, I had to go into, uh, into Denver. Um, because they don't have it a lot. They don't allow it in Springs and they don't allow it in Manitou Springs, but they do, they do allow medicinal there. Uh, I had to go as a recreational user all the way to Denver to get it. And, um, when I stopped by a little hemp shop, um, you know, that, that just sold little tchotchkes and stuff, um, made with, you know, hemp and cannabis related items i was talking to the owner and she said well just go up to this little this this little shop up there and and you can get it there and i said what are you talking about and she said she said no it's like a it's like a lounge you just go in there and you bring your stuff and there's plenty of other people there and they'll share with you and i went really and she's like yeah and she gave me the addresses some to some of these shops so even though the recreational shops and the medicinal shops aren't in every town in Colorado. They do have these little cannabis use members only clubs, you know, and for a very short time, we had one in 2010 here in uh, Las Vegas called the Bluebird Cafe that was over on uh, Paradise. And quite a few of us went over there and kind of hung out, uh, hung, hung out there. Um, but you know what? I just found that in the end, it's just easier to invite a bunch of people to my house and have a kickback than, uh, than to go to, than to go to somewhere else and have a kickback, you know? Well, it'd be nice to have a place, you know, like people that go to bars, you know, yeah. people that, it'd be nice to go to a place where you can just kick back, relax, listen to music, play some pool, enjoy your cannabis, you know? Yeah. Without having to consume alcohol, it'd be nice to have a place like that. But yeah, yeah. I mean, so so many times I don't drink at different functions because I'm driving or because I've got to work the next morning or just because I don't want to drink, which, you know, is a lot of the time. And, uh, you know, I'm sitting there not drinking, drinking my water or whatever else, you know, and I'm like, you know, I... I, I really would like to smoke something and, have to, and then have to dip out to my car and be like, come on, guys during set break and then half the audience disappears you know and i mean that's how it's been in las vegas for the longest time where you know if we want to enjoy our cannabis everybody has to dip outside and freaking smoke near our cars and then come back in you know you're right so i would like to not go out in the heat to smoke out with my friends well hopefully that's something we can advocate on we uh we mentioned washington earlier uh legal marijuana sales started uh, on july 7th supply shortages resulted in high prices and long lines there's a marijuana store in vancouver main street marijuana they closed they not not because uh supply shortages but because um the quality and price gouging oh they had tweeds yes <laughs> they had tweeds for way too much for those of you that don't know what tweeds are, that's like that's like stems and seeds and little, you know, not very good. Sometimes called ditch weed. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is from the Columbian in Washington. When the Main Street manager saw that saw what came in shipment of material from a new grower this week, he decided to close. I can't read that. He decided. <laughs> He decided to close until he could secure more variety, lower prices, and better quality stock. Wow. Wow. They want, They basically said, you know what? I don't want this garbage in my store. I'm not selling this to my patients, to my customers. I will shut my doors before I schlep your swag. <laughs> That's pretty good. Thank you. So, yeah, you know, hats off. Definitely hats off. What is it? Main Street Marijuana. So, if you are in the washington state area vancouver washington make sure you patronize main street marijuana and thank them for standing up for the quality and the price of your cannabis that's a great thing i really he i love to hear about stories like that um where people are just b basically standing up for their rights because you know the tweeds that i got in that one place in colorado i was I traveled 50 miles to get them and i was like oh my goodness and I had my friends call me and be like, why did you buy stuff at that store? And I said, just so I could get the tax thing that says I legally bought cannabis in Colorado. 
And then he came over and gave me some because he's my friend, you know. But he was just like, and I was showed him the quality of the stuff, and he's like, you know, ninety percent, or he said ninety percent of the patients in Colorado do not get their medicine from dispensaries. They get them from other patients or growing themselves. So people in Colorado that go into these shops for medicinal, there are very few of those people compared to the people that are just doing it on their own and either selling to each other or having co-ops in Colorado. And, th and that's kind of an unmentioned thing in the news. You don't hear about a lot of these co-ops, but um, my friend says that, yeah, that that's 90% of people just don't buy their stuff in a shop because the because of the prices. You can get it still cheaper, you know, from your friends. Yeah, just wait till the dispensaries open up here and watch the prices. Really? You think it's going to be high like that? Oh, I think they're going to open up, you know. What, like 100 bucks an eighth? Easily. Oh, my goodness. That's a lot. That's a lot. Well, you have some uh, breaking news there, Wilson. <laughs> Well, I was going to say the New York Times has issued a dramatic call for the federal government to repeal its ban on marijuana, saying that officials should leave the question of legalization up to the state government. So again, we're on our 10th Amendment rights, the state rights. Um, it's been more than 40 years since Congress passed the current ban on marijuana, inflicting great harm on society just to prohibit a substance that's far less dangerous than alcohol, said the opinion that was published on the cover of the paper Sunday review section. The, vet, the federal government should repeal the ban on marijuana. The editorial goes on to cite the 658,000 arrests for marijuana possession in 2012, which far outnumber arrests for any other more dangerous drug. Even worse, the result is racist, falling disproportionately on young black men, ruining their lives and creating new generations of career criminals, the editorial stated. You know, I'll have to I'll have to note to you that they they used to have this um, stop and frisk law, yeah. stop and frisk law in in New York that they would they would stop people and t you know tell them to remove the stuff them from their pockets. Well, you know what? All they had to do was go around the stock exchange, New York Stock Exchange, and white collar, and do some of that to those white guys, and watch all the cocaine fall out of their freaking pockets. How about that? Right. But no, you know they they they're racist and they're going after people. Um, they're going after people who think that they think they're racial profiling of, of, you know, people. Well, the White House responded to Sunday's New York Times editorial saying, uh, we agree that the criminal justice system is in need of reform and that disproportionate disproportion exists throughout the system. However, marijuana legalization is not the silver bullet solution to the issue. In its argument, the New York Times failed to mention a cascade of public health problems associated with the increased availability of marijuana. Really? Like what? They didn't say. They would, but the White House went on to say, while law enforcement will always play an important role in combating violent crime associated with the drug trade, the Obama administration approaches sub substance use as a public health issue, not merely a criminal justice issue. You know, that's not really true. Didn't the raids increase under Obama's administration exponentially? I don't know. They they say um, the White House is, uh, is arguing that marijuana use affects developing the brain, substance use on school aged children. They say it's addictive. They say drug driving is a threat to our road rate roadways. You know, so the Obama administration is clearly out of touch, or the president spokespeople are not getting the message. Well, you know what I what I fear of more of addiction in school aged children is those that Ritalin that you're giving your kid every day to calm them down. Does, most people don't know that that's amphetamines. You're giving your kid amphetamines to speed them up to slow them down. That makes sense, doesn't it? It, it makes absolutely no sense. Well, that's what develops the pattern for drug use in children. You giving your kids Ritalin every day to make them feel better or whatever type of Adderall or anything else that you're giving your kids to, to, to calm them down. You know what they used to do in my day? Yeah, they used to strap some tennis shoes on you and tell you, guess what, run track. Go outside and play. Go soccer. Yeah. Go outside and play. Go do something. Get off your Xbox. Go do something. If 
if what is being reported was truly the White House's response, then why are we as taxpayers still paying to supply medical marijuana to how many patients? Why are we as taxpayers spending money to cultivate marijuana, research marijuana? Why are they not letting various individuals with an education in health and science do research? Well, they did let uh, Miss Sicily do research, and they they did research, and then her bosses fired her. Yeah, you got that right. Well, we're coming up on break right now. When we get back, we'll talk about uh, Senator Rand Paul and what's going on in the House. Are you looking for a new career? For the next 20 years, 10,000 people per day in America will be turning 65. They're going to need somebody to take care of them. If you're interested in a career in home care or assisted living care, log on to ProCaregivers.com to find out how you can have a well-paying and secure job in this growing industry. The need for caregivers is so urgent that some classes are subsidized by the state, so you may not pay anything. ProCaregivers.com is certified by the state of Nevada and other states for post-secondary education training certification and can help place you in a job once your training is complete. Log on to ProCaregivers.com for more information today. They said it would never happen. They were wrong. Las Vegas Hemp Fest is here. October 4th. All ages with live performances by Burner. I party like a rock star. Let the Benz fish tail fall out the window. I got it off the of fish scale. Cypress Hill Sin Dog. Nappy Woods. Marlon Asher, also playing New Kingston. Potluck, a surprise performance from the LBC. And 25 more rap and reggae artists, speakers, and comics. Tickets available at Painless Wayne's Tattoo Shop and at the Las Vegas Hemp Fest.com. October 4th, the Las Vegas Hemp Fest. Brought to you by Dr. Reefer. Welcome back to Nevada Cannabis News Hour. I'm Jennifer Solis, and this is Raymond Fletcher. Kurt Dukach is on hiatus today, and William Beach Baker is in the house pushing our buttons. <laughs> <laughs> Senator Rand Paul proposed an amendment that would keep the federal government from prosecuting medical marijuana patients and physicians, as well as interfering with states that implement medical marijuana laws. The amendment was added to a jobs bill currently being heard on the Senate floor. Senator Paul's communication director, Brian Darling, explained the senator's move. He said, what we're trying to do is look at the law and allow states that have changed their laws and have allowed medical marijuana to do so. For doctors to be able to prescribe and for people to be able to get those prescriptions without being worried about the federal government coming in and arresting them. Well, first, for a, for a doctor to write a prescription for marijuana, it has to be on the class in a class two or below. It can't be on a class one because uh, prescription is an incorrect word. It's a recommendation. Um, so, so that's got to change. It's got to come off the schedule one um, substance list so that they can prescribe. Uh, also, in not so much doctors being prosecuted, but their own board, their medical boards, like the Nevada State Board of Medical Examiners, those are the people that the doctors fear because that's who can yank their license, censure them, fine them, uh, re-educations, you know, make them get re-educated, stuff like that. Um, so if those two things happen, um, it can certainly lighten up for sure. Well, as long as you know the state medical licensing boards have the backs of the doctors in the states that allow this, you know, then then I feel comfortable with that being the route that they should go through for any kind of uh, disciplinary actions. Yeah, for sure. Over in the House? So over in the House, uh, medical cannabis legalization bill was introduced in the U.S. House. 
Representative Scott Perry, a Republican from Pennsylvania, introduced the Charlotte's Web Medical Hemp Act of 2014 on Monday, a federal proposal to legalize medical cannabis oil that's low in the psychoactive compound tetrahydrocannabidiol, um, or THC. Uh, although the measure is clearly limited in what it would do and what type of reform it would bring, its passage would mark the first time the federal government has altered their law in admittance that the cannabis has medical value. Um, the bill is named after a little Charlotte Figgy, a, a young girl from Colorado whose parents have been com campaigning nationwide for easier access to medical cannabis after it successfully controlled their daughter's seizures. Uh, she was having upwards of 100 seizures a day and this controlled her seizures and, and is allowing her to live a more normal life, um, the high CBD extracts. Uh, this year alone, numerous states, inc including Kentucky, Iowa, Florida, Alabama, and Utah, have approved measures legalizing low THC and high CBD or cannabidiol cannabis and or those cannabis e extracts for medicinal purposes. The new measure would uh, do just that, but throughout the United States, these CBD products would be available. Um, the bill would amend the U.S. Controlled Substances Act to explicitly allow for the use of low THC cannabis oil when it is recommended by a physician. All right, this, this, in my opinion, Charlotte's Web, after listening to the Stanley brothers talk about Charlotte's Web, this is a huge marketing ploy. There are many strains of cannabis that have high CBDs. But in them marketing Charlotte's Web as the be all end all, uh, we were told by one of the Stanley brothers that he has over 9,000 people on a waiting list waiting for this. Well, you know what? The better, more responsible thing would be for them to point those people in other directions, not just say stay on this waiting list that's 9,000 people long. They would be like, hey, there are other CBD strains available and, and recommend them somewhere else instead of making these patients wait on a 9,000 long person list in Colorado so that while the child's life is held in the balance. Oh, hold up. No, I think rather than hopping around the nation, peddling yourself to get a license in other communities you should be focusing on your job in your community with your alleged 9,000 people on your alleged waiting list and you should be doing whatever you can to increase the number of cultivation facilities you have to grow enough plant to make the product you need for these children that's a good point, Raymond. That's a really good point. They should just focus on Colorado and and take and the Charlotte's Web in Colorado, and not only that, telling people that there are other high CBD strains available other than Charlotte's Web. This has become such a marketing ploy that people think that the only place that they can get the high CBD oil is in Colorado from these people. That's not true. Not only that, if you never heat the cannabis then the psychoactive properties of THC don't even come out. I make a tincture right now that you can put underneath your tongue that will not get you high, but will take your pain away and will control seizures. And it's because you do not decarbolize the plant. So the THC is THC-A. When you heat it, it knocks the A off of it. That's interesting. And, you know, if more and more individuals and more... Basically, people were able to research, you know, and the government didn't have a monopoly. You would find out that this isn't the be all end all to, you know, that. And we need to move forward. We need to advocate to make sure that, you know, hey, everyone has the opportunity to educate, to study and to research. Well, and also that THC and CBD work synergistically together. When you are just touting the CBD properties, it has anti seizure properties, but it, it doesn't have it doesn't have a lot of the healing properties. The THC and C B D work together whether it's heated or not. So if it's heated, then you get the euphoric effect. And if it's not heated, you don't get the euphoric effect, but you do get the healing properties. And so if people um, if people would just research on their own some of these facts, then, then they can save themselves a lot of heartache. Not only that, if the, if the Stanley brothers wanted to do responsible, um, responsible 
reporting in their own community, they would say that these things are out there instead of taking a list that is 9,000 people long or trafficking their product into Nevada. Or take their millions of dollars and invest into that cannabis college that they have in Colorado so they can study and research and find other CBDs to help those alleged 9,000 children rather than globe hopping, peddling yourself for money. Well, now on for happier news. <laughs> A U.S. Sentencing Commission votes unanimously to uh, make new federal guideline, drug guidelines retroactive. So hundreds of low-level marijuana offenses could be thrown out. Exactly. This is really, really good news for some of our people that are, that are you know, on the front line, that are soldiers here in uh, Nevada and other places that have, that have been arrested for cannabis crimes or marijuana trafficking or whatever else that they say that they're, you know, that they say has been done or selling patient to patient. Um, if they throw out all of these crimes, then you know what? Those little DEA task force will need to find somebody else to arrest and harass. No, they can go after the meth addicts, the cocaine, sure. the crackheads, the, the the pill pushers. You know, and, and it, it's, it's, as a human being, as an American, more, no, as a human being, first and foremost, it floors me that somebody who offends a child can get a slap on a wrist. Somebody that, that, that rapes a woman can get three years and, and they're out in nine months and you get busted for a little quarter bag of weed and you get five years, you get 20 years. It sickens me that these people that prey on children get, get less time in jail than somebody who possesses cannabis. I. Yeah, I, I'm right there with you. And hopefully this will have the, a domino effect in all of the United States. Um, a Brooklyn District Attorney uh, Keith Thompson has assembled a team that's reviewing hundreds of low-level marijuana offenses uh, that the department could decline to prosecute. Uh, the DA... Uh, the DA said that he's laying out a plan to cease prosecution of all minor marijuana arrests. Fantastic. Now, if you look at the number of marijuana arrests, or not even the number, the cons the, the, the race, we'll just say it, the race mm -hmm. of marijuana arrests, the majority of them are African American. Yeah. that You know, that's true. I was once, um, I, I was sitting at a city council um, meeting and I uh, was told by a city council person that um, out of every 10 black men that go out uh, on Friday night uh, at least seven of them will be arrested over the weekend and and I said that can't be true that can't be true um, <laughs> yeah exactly but uh, apparently it is here in Nevada that 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 it that people are getting arrested based upon their race uh, first and and secondly what they have in their pockets it's i don't know the decline of america <laughs> well actually we're more on to happy news uh life in the legal weed economy there are so many jobs and job opportunities coming up here in nevada that it is unreal uh by november december um people will be looking for workers we are going to have an uh uh, job Expo on August 25th at the Clark County Public Library in the main theater. That's off of Flamingo. There's going to be more to come on this in, in the weeks to come, but basically we are going to um, have people taking applications for medical cannabis jobs here in Nevada. Um, as our industry is growing, we are going to need people that know how to grow, know how to trim, know how to roll, know how to be dispensaries, and uh, and more. Um, so e this is not like a KFC job. No, it'll be interesting. But that's all the time we have for our news. Join us Friday. Friday for First Friday? First Friday. We'll be out at First Friday, everybody. And then our second Saturday is our Patients First Meeting, which is a patient support group meeting. Um, and then we'll see you again on Tuesday. See you next week. Thanks for listening, y'all. Thank you.